This is how the zombie apocalypse started. Now with a bang, but with a whisper. What I'm about to tell you may shock you to your core. Or maybe, probably most likely, you just think I'm batshit crazy. But if I can reach just a few of you out there, then I consider my job done. My job being to provide you with tools to save your lives in the months and years to come. But before we get into that, let me take you back to the start. This would be around the start of COVID, although I have no definite proof that these events are related. Back in mid-December 2019, when I was a mere taxpayer with an 8-to-5 job, I started noticing some weird stuff happening. One of my colleagues at the office started acting strange, seemingly from one day to the next. He began coming into the office very early, even though he always claimed not to be a morning person, and it was perpetually late before. When I confronted him, he ignored my question. As we'd never been friends, I dismissed it. Then one day, about a week later, I ran into him at the coffee corner where he was drinking milk. I could tell because our coffee cups were transparent. It was strange because at the office we only had those small condensed milk packages. I didn't want to be rude, so I didn't ask. The next day, the same thing. Day after that, again. And always at the exact same time. So the next day, I went in a bit earlier and just made myself look busy when he finally came into the kitchen. He took a cup and put it under the coffee machine. He then pressed on the capsule he wanted, but the whole row had been empty for more than a week. When nothing came, he pressed the button to make coffee, but only hot water poured, naturally, as there was no capsule. He then proceeded to open two packages of condensed milk and pour them into the hot water. The whole time this was happening, I couldn't help but stare. Yet, he didn't seem to notice me. He just drank his hot water and milk and went on about his day. It was so strange. Yet, I really didn't know what to make of it. The next day, the row of coffee capsules had been filled and he went back to drinking coffee. Beginnings of the years are busy for us, so I didn't have time to follow him around properly. But sure enough, the very strictly timed routine continued as far as I could tell. That was the first instance I noticed something wasn't right in the world, and because it was such an isolated case, it didn't even cross my mind that it would mean something bigger was lingering in the shadows. Then, COVID started. It was insane. Lockdown, working from home, I had very little social interaction. Then, finally, we were allowed to go to grocery shopping, and there I noticed more weirdness. It was small, so small that if I hadn't had the experience with my colleague, I might have missed it. Remember how in COVID, there were certain supermarket aisles that were just completely empty? Think toilet paper, cans, flour, etc. Well, I'd noticed some people coming up the flour aisle, for example, staring at it for 30 seconds and then leaving. I'd noticed the same people doing the same thing every day at the same time. Then, when the flour was resupplied, they'd grab a bag. Every day, a bag of flour, or a can of tomato soup, or a pack of eight rolls of toilet paper. Every day. Eight rolls of toilet paper. What a shitty household, right? So I decided to follow these people. There weren't many. Maybe one or two in each supermarket. And some, none. I just started going to various supermarkets and noting behaviors down. I had named my subjects. I had flower power, crap rap fella, soup and McSoup face, and so on. I was so intrigued by crap rap so I followed him first. This was around May, but I was still working from home. So I followed Crap Rap home the first night, and then the early next morning, I packed my work laptop and camped his building, intent on following him around the whole day. He came out around 7.15, dressed in a gray suit, and went to the bus stop. He got a number 12 and got off four stops later in an office building. I couldn't follow him there, so I proceeded to work from the coffee place across the street. Crap Rap got out at 5.15, went to the bus stop, took number 12 in the other direction, and went home. At 7.20 in the evening, Crap Rap got out of his house again, this time dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, and went to the supermarket where I first met him. He did his grocery shopping, every day the same, including eight rolls of toilet paper, and went home. At first glance, this was so ordinary, so normal, that I was the crazy one, borderline stalking at this point. But those eight rolls... I just couldn't understand. And then the standing and the staring at the aisle. 
and my colleague with his hot water and milk. So I went back the next day, and sure enough, Crap Rab did the same thing, at the same time. The only thing that was different was his clothing. Work, 7.15 to 5.15. Grocery shopping at 7.20. Always with an 8 roll. I followed him for a whole week. On Saturday, he wouldn't leave the house until 7.20 to go grocery shopping. On Sunday, he wouldn't leave at all. I then followed Flower Power. She also had a strict routine, albeit different from Crap Wraps. She'd leave the house at 5.30, and she'd work at a bakery. She'd come at 3 and go grocery shopping at exactly 6.25 p.m. Soupy seemed to be a nightclub bouncer, so he'd do his grocery shopping at lunchtime, and he'd work nights. 1 p.m. for food, always with that one can of tomato soup, working 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. None of these people drove cars. None of them were seen in the company of others apart from at work, and none of these people went anywhere else. My colleague, whom I'd named Coffeeson, had a routine of his own. It could be that I stumbled upon a few very sad people, with not much going on for them, or it could be that there was a pattern. So I went online. At first search, on regular sites, news outlets, and the normal part of Reddit, I found nothing. Then I dug deeper, more obscure places, Conser conspiracy theory subreddits of the sort. Sure enough, not long after, I stumbled upon similar anecdotes. I lurked around those websites and subreddits for a few weeks as they got more and more of vis visibility. First, there were maybe a dozen people describing such happenings. Then, by the end of 2020, there were thousands of accounts. Not enough to become mainstream, but enough to catch the attention of mods and supervisors. The accounts started to get banned, and the posts or articles were removed. Beginning in 2021, there was little evidence left that anything was happening. Sure enough, on my end, crap rap. Where was he storing all that paper? Soupy and Co. was going strong, and I'd added a good 20 or so more of these people to my list. It was getting difficult to survey them all. I decided to take action and talk to someone. I looked on Reddit for one of those accounts I had observed before, but, not unexpectedly, I couldn't find them anymore. Then one day, on an obscure subreddit, someone posted something about it. The user said that the post would be removed within 15 minutes, but that if we had any sort of encounters with what they were calling robot people, to contact them right away. So I did. The user responded instantly, giving me another username. I was vetted for about an hour, and then was directed to another user. This one asked me to describe my encounters with the robot people, and then I was directed to another user. I felt like I had called IT support was being jerked around. Finally, about five hours in, I was giving nothing but the web address to a forum. There, I could find again, the thousands of accounts removed from mainstream internet in the months prior. Since I promised myself I wouldn't be the quiet observer anymore, I started interacting with the forums. Soon enough, I was contacted by someone from the area. They had guessed my location based on Crap Rap, who they observed at their local supermarket. They seemed to be a community that believed in the existence of the robot people, and I was invited to meet them in person. At first, I was very reluctant. For me, what I was reading in the forums, and what I had experienced myself, it became a little too much. So I ignored the invite and distanced myself for a while. I have to add that this was happening towards the end of 2021. Then, in 2022, a series of aggressions around the world started. As I was watching the evening news, one night in March, I noticed something off. It was one of those world peace summits where, behind the spokesperson, there was a fellow who was acting ever so strangely. He would just take his phone out of his pocket precisely every 4 minutes and 23 seconds and look at it for a second, then put it back in his pocket. He did this for the whole duration of the speech, which lasted well over an hour. As the camera was filming the speaker, but also the other world leaders' reactions and questions, at one moment, it hovered over the guy's phone as he was taking out of his pocket. The phone was not on. There was nothing on the screen. It was completely dark like it was out of battery or something. So what the hell was he checking every 4 minutes and 23 seconds? Again, were there any isolated event? Again, was this an isolated event? I wouldn't think twice about it, but with everything else combined, I was half sold on the robot people, and now I was convinced that infiltrating governments so I went back to my forum and wrote to the community. They replied to me within an hour, 
and organized an emergency meeting for me that very evening. I attended. It was very informal. We met at a coffee shop in the center, not a Starbucks, but one of those cozy little shops that are open late into the evenings, but serve nothing but coffee, soft drinks, and muffins. There were six people who came to meet me, but I was informed that there were many more out there in our city. The leader, or at least the delegated speaker, was called John. They wanted to know my experiences with dates and locations. When I told them about Coffeeson, they all seemed surprised. I seemed to be one of the very first observers. Most people did not notice anything strange until well into 2020. They were very cryptic and did not give much information. I think I was once again being vetted, and I must have passed their test when they gave me the address to their headquarters and told me to come to the next day. The headquarters was a small warehouse just outside the city. I quickly learned it belonged to Sam, one of the people I had met the night before. It was a small supermarket owner, the one in which Flower Power shopped. He was also one of the first to notice the strange behavior within the community, and from what I could gather, he was one of the founders. There was nothing much going on at the headquarters, for in 2022, they were still quite static in the sense that they would meet, discuss what they'd observe, agree on who to follow next, and etc. When I told them what I'd seen on the TV of the night, they seemed shocked, which I had not expected. It seemed that, once again, I was the first to observe this, which meant it might have not have been a common occurrence, or at least that's what we thought at the time. As violence increased throughout Europe and the Middle East, robot people could be spotted easier and easier, more and more frequently. I was not going to daily or even weekly meetings within the community, but I was keeping tabs on them and feeding them information whenever I had it. One day, Sam texted me saying that I should stop by the headquarters as soon as I manage. It was early 2023, and I hadn't been there in about three months. I stopped by after work. It was busier than usual, but I bumped into John on the way from the parking lot. He told me that they'd made progress, and I wasn't sure what that meant. We never made any moves, so how could we make any progress, I thought. It all became clear as we stepped inside the main hallway. Instead of the usual warehouse setup, it was now transformed into some sort of studio apartment, which was surrounded by what seemed to be plexiglass a sophisticated, transparent cage. Inside, to my horror, no other than Coffeeson. I remember at the time, I freaked out. Full, like full on meltdown. They sedated me. I guess part of me never wanted to accept that something was actually happening for the longest time. And when I saw Coffeeson, my biggest fear came true. The one where I had become a part of a cult, a group of people with misplaced belief system who were now kidnapping innocents. When I woke up from my sedation, I was alone in a room with Sam. He explained to me that they reprogrammed Coffeeson to believe that it's always Sunday, and for this reason, he never leaves his apartment. They did so by changing his phone date, which they would always reset every morning. They reconstructed the apartment here. Coffeeson had no idea he was being watched. He would just wake up, check his phone, and then sit on the bed. The whole day as if he was waiting for something. He would not eat or drink, nor would he use the bathroom. He'd just sit, and when night came, he would lie down. They showed me, and I could not believe my eyes. This was Coffeeson's eighth Sunday in a row. He hadn't eaten or drank in eight days, and then he looked perfectly fine. I wonder if that's what the rest of them do when they're on a Sunday, or even every time they're alone in their apartments or houses. Sam and John confirmed to me that it was. I asked what was next, and they told me they were trying to see whether they could find a doctor to do tests on Coffeeson. This made me feel uncomfortable again. Sam then explained to me that he couldn't let me leave until the shock wore off, as they couldn't risk me alerting authorities. My, action, my reaction was bad, apparently. Unfortunately for me, they knew my living situation fine. Well, they knew I was, had no one waiting for me, not even a cat or a dog. They made me ask for days off from work, and I complied. I was scared. Scared of these people, but also scared of coffee son of what this meant for the world. A few days later, after several talks, I wholeheartedly agreed that it was for the greater good that they test copies in. There were several similar developments in other parts of the world, so they managed to find a doctor. Maria had seen a couple of other similar patients. She confirmed that Coffeeson was no different. Coffeeson was not alive. He did not have a heartbeat or brain function. It was like he was in a coma, but seemed to be able to perform predetermined mechanical tasks. Maria is the word zombie. 
Coffeeson was, for all intents and purposes, a non-aggressive zombie. That was the first time it occurred to me, to us, that the zombie apocalypse had begun. Then Maria ran some more tests and left to see another community. We kept in touch with people from all over the world at a greater scale since then. One day, this was maybe in the middle of summer, we received a message from our friends in Pakistan reporting small isolated incidents that they could not explain. One of the zombies that were tracking went full on aggressive and started killing people on the streets, after which he was just exploded. The news did not pick it up. Similar reports came from Afghanistan, Uganda, and even Ukraine. Nothing was reported, but we received some video footage from surveillance cameras. In one of them, you can see a tall man walking up to a zombie in a mall, whispering something in his ear, and then turning around and walking out. Cool guys don't look at explosions, I guess. What followed immediately after was a massacre, with no survivors. Last week, Sam was attacked. It happened in his own supermarket. Someone activated flower power. Eight people died. Twelve were injured. He's still in the hospital. We thought our small city would not be at risk. Not so soon, at least. We are not sure what to do next, but we live in constant fear that one of these creatures can be activated at any point in time and unleash hell on Earth. We are also struggling with different opinions from within our group. Some believe this is the end of the world in a biblical sense, and that we should just let it play out. Others want to contact authorities. Others have no trust in the government and want to make matters into their own hands. We are on the brink of a disaster, and again, I find myself to be a mere observer. And in the meantime, these zombies remain a ticking time bomb. So if you happen to see any robot-like behavior, take note of it. Stay out of their path. That's right. Almost every single zombie movie was wrong. Kind of strange, seeing as there are so many films related to the genre, right? 28 Weeks Later, The Walking Dead, not a movie I know. The Cured... Zombieland, World War Z, don't even get me started on World War Z, and I am legend. You get the picture. All wrong. I mean, the infected were as ferocious as those of World War Z or 28 weeks later, and sometimes as numerous, but grouped up as The Walking Dead. Yes, in many sad and sorrowful cases, they did chew lots of people to bits, and then still hungry, cross entire continents in incomprehensible large hordes like in Z Nation to feed on more innocent souls in greener pastures. But no, the so-called zombie apocalypse was boring. Just mind-numbingly tedious, dull, and quite literally dead boring. Most of the time. In fact, the infected became more of a nuisance than a world-ending threat. Why, you may ask? Well, the answer is more obvious than you think. Ask yourself, what have humans been doing for millennia? And what will they always continue to do until they finally do actually meet their miserable end? Kill each other. Yes, we have no qualms about dropping nuclear bombs which could incinerate hundreds of thousands of people in an instant on each other in Japan. What makes you think a person who is infected with a disease that can make them brutally savage a whole room of people, tearing them into crimson soap shreds of flesh which makes a sad squelchy sound as they hit the cold gray floor? not die as quickly as someone who doesn't have an innate drive for human flesh and in infecting others. In fact, we, as a race, were too good at killing the infected. So good, it was scary. More scary than the infected themselves. When they began to emerge into large groups that could breach a city's defenses, they could be moabbed into the next world in which they should have passed already. Got a group of flesh-hungry freaks chasing after you? Nothing a few rounds from a general-purpose machine gun couldn't fix. Have a 250-pound bloodthirsty man-beast slamming its polarized fist on the door of your quiet suburban home? Nothing a 9mm pistol couldn't solve. Heat-seeking missiles, miniguns, Kalashnikovs, rocket-propelled grenades, hand-tossed grenades, Apache gunships, if you were lucky, seaborne guns, even handheld weapons with a certain range, were all of use. For many across the world, when the infected came, it was just business as usual. Instead of shooting at whoever was shooting back at you, you now join them in shooting, mouth-foaming, bloodshot-eyed monsters dressed in ripped jeans. It was like a turkey shoot. Hell, the infected even promoted regional peace in some places. Israel joined Palestine together to cut down anything that dared enter the Sinai Peninsula. In Mexico, rival cartels and gangs joined together to protect the local population, at least the ones who could pay enough, from a marauding monstrosity. Even India and Pakistan set to fight together 
until a small border issue escalated into a nuclear holocaust the world has never seen the likes of before. The exact location of patient zero is unknown. What we do now know, however, is that the infection started to pick up pace in Zambia, being given the name Zambian rabies. Then later the nickname of the Nile flu, due to its transmission down the world's longest river. After a few weeks, it was established that a local effort to curb the spread of the virus had successfully contained it to Africa. The vast majority of cases were in sub-Saharan Africa, where the ability to fight back was poor, and a few cases had sprung up on the periphery of North Africa. Despite the successful containment, it was not enough to stop the impending collapse. People did something else that they have done for millennia when they are faced with civilizational threats. They freaked. Here in Britain, the fear-fueled masses hit the supermarkets hard. They plundered the canned food and non-perishable aisles, and then ate through what was left of the perishable goods in a matter of hours. Financial institutions collapsed within the day, and the government collapsed within the week. So much for strong and stable. Martial law ensued. People got hungry, stayed indoors for days, not daring to venture outside into the chaotic new world which had been bequeathed upon them by fear. Soon they began to starve. Those with food had it taken from them by those with more firepower. Then those with firepower were slowly dealt with by those who had even more firepower, namely the army. People were rumored to have begun eating each other long before the infected showed up. Lord Henry Kitchener's new military government actions in those early days were the only thing that managed to keep some semblance of order. After the mass freakout was when the boredom began. 20% of the population had died from starvation, lack of water, or in the maelstrom of violence which followed the news of the outbreak. For me personally, it wasn't that different. For the first few hours a day the electricity comes back on, I sit in my room watching YouTube or posting to Reddit. However, when the electricity goes out between 9 p.m. and 12 p.m. the next day, I sometimes wish I was fighting the infected. At least that would be somewhat entertaining. Life is somewhat normal now. You can go to the shop and exchange a ration toke for some bread, vegetables, and meat. A bit like how my grandfather described the jolly old days of the Blitz. At least they had a fighting spirit back then. You could take a stroll down the street passing a heavily armored vehicle or two. Their occupants engaged in a game of cards, rifles slung lazily on their backs. Perhaps you are entertained by more worldly pleasures. You can engage in many forms of illicit activity, which would not be fulfilled before. There were no luxury summer holidays abroad. The only aircraft flying overhead were being military in nature. No more trips to the movies. No more McDonald's drive through A little TV, and certainly no more drunken nights to the local nightclub. Just boredom. The infection has spread into mainland Europe now, but it is mainly under control. Most places are holding up fine only threatened at night when visibility is low, and infected that have been hiding during the day come out to ravage local populations. We in Britain are experiencing a sort of phony war again, just sitting and waiting for the infection to reach our shores, if we don't all die from boredom first. I am a zombie, and it's not so bad. I'm learning to live with it. I'm sorry I can't properly introduce myself, but I don't have a name anymore. Hardly any of us do. We forget them, like anniversaries and pin numbers. I think mine might have started with a T, but I'm not sure. It's funny, because back when I was alive, I was forgetting other people's names. I am finding that irony abounds in the zombie life, an ever-present punchline, but it's hard to smile when your lips have rotted off. Before I became a zombie, I think I was a businessman or young professional of some kind. I think I worked in one of those stifling office jobs in a high-rise somewhere. The clothes clinging to the remains of my body are high-quality business casual. Fine garbadine slacks, silvery silk shirt, red Armani power tie. I would probably look pretty sharp if my intestines weren't dragged at my feet. <laughs> we like to joke and speculate about our remaining outfits, since these final fashion choices are usually the only indication of who we were before we became no one. Some people's are less obvious than mine. Jeans and a white t-shirt, skirt and a tank top. So we make random guesses. You were a plumber. You were a barista. Ring any bells? It usually doesn't. No one I know has any specific memories. We recognize some things, buildings, cars, Armani ties, but context eludes us. We are here, we do what we do. We lack excellent diction, 
but we do communicate. We grunt and groan. We make hand gestures, and sometimes a few words slip out. It's not that different from before. There are a few hundred of us living in a wide plain of dust outside some large city. We don't need shelter or warmth, obviously. We stand around in the dust, and time passes. I think we've been here a long time. Despite my dragging entrails, I am in decay's early stages. But there are a few elderly ones here who are little more than skeletons with clinging bits of muscle. Somehow, it still extends and contracts and they keep moving. I've never seen any of us die of old age. Maybe we live forever. I don't know. I don't think much about the future anymore. That's something that's very different from before. When I was alive, the future was all I thought about. Obsessed about. Death has relaxed me. But it makes me sad that we've forgotten our names. Out of everything, this seems to be the most tragic. I don't miss my own, but I mourn for everyone else's. Because I want to love them, but I don't know who they are. Today a group of us are going into town to find some food. How this expedition begins is one of the, us gets hungry and starts shuffling towards town, and a few others follow him. Focus thought is a rare occurrence with us, and we follow when we see it. Otherwise, we would just be standing around and groaning. We do a lot of standing and groaning, and it's frustrating sometimes. Years pass this way. The flesh withers on our bones, and we stand around, waiting for it. I am curious how old I might be. The city where the people live is not that far. We arrive around noon and start looking for living flesh. The new kind of hunger is a strange feeling. You don't feel it in your stomach. Of course not, since some of us don't have stomachs. You feel it just... everywhere. You start to feel more dead. I've watched some of my friends go back to being full dead when food is scarce. They just slow down and stop. They become corpses again. I don't really understand it. I guess the world has mostly ended, because the cities we wandered through are decaying as fast as we are. Buildings are collapsed. Dead, rusted cars fill the streets. All glass everywhere is shattered. I don't know if it was a war, or a plague, or if it was just us. Maybe it was all three. I don't know. I don't think about things like that anymore. In a cluster of broken down apartment buildings, we find some people, and we eat them. Some of them have weapons. And as usual, we lose some of our number. But we don't care. Why would we care? What's death now? Eating is not a pleasant business. I chew off a man's arm, and I hate this. It's disgusting. I hate his screams, because I don't like pain. I don't like to hurt things. But this is the world now. This is what we do. Of course, if I don't eat all of him, if I leave just enough, he'll rise up and follow me back to our dusty field outside the city. And that might make me feel better. I'll introduce him to everyone. And maybe we'll stand around and groan for a while. It's hard to say what friends are anymore. But maybe that's close. If I don't eat all of him. If I leave enough. But of course I don't leave enough. I eat his brain. Because it's the good part. That's the part that, when I swallow it, makes my head light up with feelings. Clear memories. For about three to ten seconds depending on the person. I get to feel alive. I get traces of delicious meals, beautiful music, perfume, orgasms, sunsets, life. Then it fades, and I get up and stumble out of the city, still dead, but feeling a little less... feeling okay. I don't know why we have to eat people. I don't understand what chewing off a man's neck accomplishes. We certainly don't digest the meat and absorb the nutrients. My stomach is a rotted bag of dried bile. Useless. We don't digest. We just eat until the weight forces it out of our assholes. And then we eat more. It feels so useless. And yet, it keeps us walking. I don't know why. None of us really understand why we are here. We don't know if we're the result of some strange global infection, or some ancient curse, or something even more senseless. We don't talk about it much. Existential debate is not a major part of zombie life. We are here, and we do things. We are simple. It's nice sometimes. 
Outside the city again, back with the others in the dust field, I start walking in a circle for no reason. I plan one foot in the dirt and pivot on it, around and around, kicking up clouds of dust. Before, when I was alive, I could never have done this. I remember stress. I remember bills and deadlines, asset retention reports. I remember being so occupied, so always everywhere all the time occupied. Now I'm just standing in a wide open field of dust, walking in a circle. The world has been distilled. Being dead is easy. After a few days of this, I stop walking and I stand still, swaying back and forth, groaning a little. I don't know why I groan. I'm not in pain, and I'm not sad. I think it's just air being squeezed in and out of my lungs. When my lungs decompose, it will probably stop. And now, while swaying and groaning, I'd notice a dead woman standing a few feet away from me, facing the distant mountains. She doesn't sway or groan. Her head just lolls from side to side. I like that about her, that she doesn't sway or groan. I walk over and stand beside her. I wheeze some kind of greeting, and she responds with a lurch of her shoulder. I like her. I reach out and touch her hair. She has not been dead very long. Her skin is gray and her eyes slightly sunken, but she has no exposed bones or organs. Her death outfit is a black skirt and a snug white button-up. I suspect she used to be a waitress. Pinned to her chest is a silver name tag. I can read her name. She has a name. Her name is Emily. I point to her chest. Slowly, with great effort, I say, Emery! The word rolls off what's left of my tongue like honey. What a good name. I feel warm saying it. Emily's cloudy eyes widen at the sounds, and she smiles. I also smile. And then maybe I'm a little nervous, because my tibia snaps, and I fall backwards into the dust. Emily just laughs, and it's a choked, raw, lovely sound. She reaches down and helps me to my feet. Emily and I have fallen in love. I'm not sure how this happens. I remember what love was like before, and this is different. This is simpler. Before, there were complex and emotional and biological factors at work. We had long checklists and elaborate tests we passed. We looked at hairstyles and careers and breast sizes, and sex was there, and everything, confusing everyone, like hunger. It created longing. It created ambition, competition. It drove people to leave their houses and invent automobiles, spacecraft, and atom bombs, when they could instead just sit on the couch until they died. Animal cravings. Subconscious urges. Sex made the world go round. This is all gone now. Sex, once a force of universal's gravity, is now irrelevant. Ambition and longing have left the equation. My penis fell off two weeks ago. So the equation is deleted, the blackboard erased, and things are different now. Our actions have no ulterior motives. We shuffle around in the dust and occasionally have lumbering, grunting exchanges with our peers. No one argues. There are no fights. Ever. And Emily is not a complicated process. I just see her and walk over to her, and for no reason, really, I decide I want to be with her for a long time. So now we shuffle around in the dust together instead of alone. For whatever reason, we enjoy each other's company. When we have to go into town to eat people, we do it at separate times, because it's unpleasant, and we don't want to share that. But we share everything else and it's nice. We decided to walk to the mountains. It takes us three days, but now we are standing on a cliff looking up at a fat white moon. At our backs, the night sky is red from distant cities burning, but we don't care about that. I clumsily grab Emily's hand, and we stare at the moon. There's no real reason for any of this, but like I said, the world has been distilled. Love has been distilled. Everything is easy now. Yesterday my leg broke off, and I don't even mind. My best friend caught that bullshit zombie virus. I think I helped her spread it across the state. Tammy and I had been joking about the virus for a week. We live in a small town and our journalists get bored. They interview anyone they can. So when a woman ate some dude's heart out and another woman cut her boyfriend's finger off, the news was all over it. It was clear from the beginning they didn't have many answers. No autopsy reports were released to the public, 
No explanation as to why the events had happened. No explanation, that is, except for the shit our town's tiny members came up with. I swear to God this sounds just like zombie virus that I worked with back in the 60s, old Miss Fritz cried out in the microphone. I don't know how, and I don't know the local news team tracked her down, but they did. Miss Fritz is always going on about the shit she did in the 60s. Working with a zombie virus is nothing new. A tan Toyota Camry blew past us, very clearly running the red light and nearly plowing the side of several cars. I rolled my eyes from the passenger seat and stretched my arms out. I waved them up and down stiffly, turning my head towards Tammy. Oh no, it must be the zombie virus, I growled. Tammy whooped with laughter and slammed her palms against the steering wheel as we legally went through the light. All right, but on a serious note, non-batshit crazy note, we're supposed to turn in about a mile to drop those groceries off. I was Tammy's faithful navigator. I went with her on most food deliveries she picked up, unless I was out doing my own. She claimed I kept her from getting lost and getting kidnapped. Whatever positive thing she thought worked for me. I was hopelessly in love with my best friend. Left or right, Tammy's voice cracked a bit, and I could tell she was about to spiral into panic mode. She didn't do well driving, or navigating, or talking to strangers. All things required to work for Hubgrub. It's going to be on the left, and it's going to be okay. Okay? I soothed. I reached a hand over the space between us, squeezing her arm gently before pulling away. We will get in, get out. I'll even help you talk to the lady and drop the food off, okay? She nodded. Her face was more tense than when we started this trip, and her knuckles were stark white, but she put her turn signal on and turned where we should. I tried to smile at her, help her as much as I could. I'll drive after this. You still rake in the tips, but you don't have to drive anymore. I got you. I promise. She relaxed visibly. I knew she was stressed out because this was the first grocery shopping assignment we'd received from Hub Grub. Apparently, they had teamed up with the local supermarkets to help families get fast food and groceries to their front steps without having to lift more than a finger. I directed her to the lady's house, Bandy W., and told her when to park. Down past Bandy's house, we could see that some kind of craziness was going down. A car was wrapped around a tree, and people were running around the front yard like lunatics. I could have sworn the car wrapped around the tree was none other than that tan Camry that had blown past us. I tried to joke with Tammy about the virus again. Can we just get this done? She ignored my joke. I could see the stress in her face. I worried we were headed straight to Panic Town again. Pop the trunk. Get the groceries. I'll talk to Bandy, I said. Tammy hadn't released her grip on the wheel by the time I reached Bandy's front door, but I figured I could talk long enough to give her some time. I knew she needed it. I tapped on the glass screen door, peeking inside just a little bit. There were oodles of toddlers traipsing around this lady's foyer, and I mean oodles. I counted at least nine crotch goblins wobbling around. They were drooling over various soft toys and staring at me with an intensity I didn't like one bit. That was one pro to being a child-free lesbian, I thought. There's even less of a chance I'll end up with this many soul-sucking crawlers around. The baby's attention refocused to something else in the house, and I figured Mama Bandy was on the way. I plastered a smile on my face and glanced behind me quickly. Tammy was finally shakily climbing out of the car and getting the groceries from the back. Bandy came to the door a second later, looking every bit like the mother of nine children would. I didn't even blame her for ordering groceries online. How do you pack that many heathens into the van and go? How do you even leave, actually? Hi, ma'am. Bandy? I said as she popped open the glass door. Several of the drooling monsters rose from the floor and tumbled towards the sunshine. Yes, she confirmed. I held up Tammy's smartphone, telling her it was our first time delivering groceries, but we knew she needed to sign the dotted line. While she did so, a particularly odd-looking rugrat stepped onto the porch of their mom. He was drooling hard and his eyes were glazed, unfocused. He looked like he might have had a fever of some sort. I'll go help bring the rest in, I told Bandy, barely escaping the reaching, sickly grasp of wobbly toddlers as I bounded off the front stoop and headed toward the car. Tammy struggled with the amount of groceries she had on her own arms. 
Tammy struggled with the amount of groceries she had in her own arms. I watched as she walked a little cockeyed to the front door, grinning at Bandy in that nervous way she grins at all strangers. Bandy started taking bags from Tammy, and as I grabbed the remaining groceries and slammed the trunk, I watched as a sickly toddler grabbed hold of Tammy's bare leg. Tammy wasn't nearly the dick I was when it came to kids. She peered down at the young and with genuine, sparkling attention. She even bent down a little to talk to the boy once Bandy had removed enough of the grocery load. Just as I came up behind Tammy with the last of the bags, the boy looked up into Tammy's looming face and sneezed. I recalled automatically, accidentally letting slip a gross. Bandy sent me a scathing look, and I worried for Tammy's review. Tammy, ever the professional, albeit nervous as fuck, individual as she was, simply laughed and wiped the hand across her face. I loved her laugh. Even the super fake, baby just sneezed in my eye laugh. Bandy relaxed a little and took the groceries from my hands. Her and Tammy exchanged pleasantries for a minute as I went back to the car, waiting for the driver's side door. Tammy seemed to be genuinely enjoying interacting with the customer for once. The little boy still had his little boy talon dug into her calf, but she really didn't seem to mind. Finally, Tammy and Bandy stopped talking. Tammy walked back towards the car with a distracted look on her face. She paused in front of me, looking confused. Ready to go? I asked. Tammy was so close to me, I could smell the perfume she used daily. Daisy something or other. My heart skipped a beat. I'll drive, Tammy said. She almost didn't sound like herself. I thought I was going to drive. Help you out? I asked. Instead of responding, Tammy simply shoved past me and hopped in the driver's seat, nipping my heels at the door when she popped it open. Hey, I protested. I figured the stress must just have overwhelmed her, so I ran the passenger side and got in, not saying much else. Her smartphone dinged in my hand, signaling to us that now that we had dropped the delivery off, we were ready for our next one. Um, now we're going to go pick up a $40 pizza order for some dude named Joe. Head up to Max. You know the way, I instructed Tammy gently. She again didn't respond. Instead, she peeled out of the driveway like a fucking lunatic. What the fuck? I shouted, gripping the oh shit handle just in case. Tammy wasn't the best driver. She surely never treated the road or someone's driveway like the NASCAR track. I watched as Tammy's face paled. Her mouth twisted up in a gruesome grin, completely unlike any face I'd ever seen her make. She retched the volume knob to way above any limit she'd usually let her sound system go. I was floored as she, well, floored it. I looked behind us and saw the Toyota smoking around the tree. Mandy didn't seem bothered by Tammy's actions. I didn't see a single other neighbor on the street to complain. Tammy ignored every direction I gave her. She ignored every question I had. Ignored every expletive I screeched when she took the millionth turn to Sharp. Ignored the crossing pedestrians and ran lights. It was almost like Tammy wasn't there. At all. I considered calling someone. Maybe she was suffering a total break from the reality. I realized, though, that I could rather die in a fiery car crash than betray the rest of my friend. Eventually, I just let her drive. I didn't interrupt. Didn't squeak in fear. Didn't even close my eyes. I watched her as openly as I watched the road. She was never once asked me in her adorable, nervous way, what the fuck was I staring at? I should have been shocked when she pulled up to the airport. It was a holiday weekend. Cars were everywhere, people honking and screaming from their windows. I should have been surprised because the airport was the last place Tammy would have gotten caught dead, no matter the money or the cause. But Tammy wasn't acting like Tammy. She roared into a spot reserved for Ubers and hopped out, leaving her keys in the ignition. I scrambled to turn the car off grabbed her phone, and locked the doors before I lost her in the crowd. We already had several people squalling at us for taking up a reserve spot. I threw on my most charming, apologetic smile and ducked after Tammy. She was pushing her way through the crowd. People seemed to be mainly trying to get into the airport, not leave it, and there was a clusterfuck of the doors. Tammy was shoulder-checking people and forcing her tiny body through the masses. I followed as politely as I could, with as little shoving as I could get away with my face burning the fuck up with embarrassment. Tammy stopped when she reached the center of the airport. The center. There were hundreds of people racing to get to the elevators, escalators, ticket counters, and their terminals. By the time I reached her in the throng of people, I had witnessed her be nearly trampled several times. 
I gripped Shammy's shoulder and spun her towards me. I was out of breath and sweating. Fuck, was there a lot of people here? What the fuck are you doing? I gasped. It was then I saw her eyes. Tammy was completely gone. There was nothing human left in her tiny glance she passed over my face. I searched her for a sign of illness. Sweating, drooling, clammy skin, anything to explain why the fuck she was acting the way she was. I saw nothing. Tammy, or the shell of Tammy, or whatever the fuck that was, retched away from my grasp and walked deeper into the crowd of people. I lost sight of her for a moment, maybe two. A wispy cloud of red, thickened quickly by streams of gore, exploded into the air, followed by the screams of too many people to imagine. I started elbowing my way through the crowd. A feeling in my gut told me the wave of intestines that had popped into the air of unsuspecting travelers belonged to the love of my life. A feeling I desperately wanted to ignore. The scream of passengers became overwhelming as I delved into the crowd. I didn't even have to really shove people out of the way for very long. The people were parting like the Red Sea. A circle of people with their phones out, recording, remained around the source of blood and guts. I pushed past a particularly paunchy woman with a brick for a phone, snapping grainy pictures and mumbling nonsense endlessly. A glance at her fuzzy screen confirmed my horrible feelings. The screen showed a flowered red dress in shreds, filled with gore and blood. Tammy had been wearing her favorite red sundress. I wish I hadn't looked past the woman's cell phone. I wish I could forget what I saw. I wish I knew exactly what it meant. Tammy, what remained of her anyway, lay at my feet. Veins had fired out in jagged patterns against the floor and the feet of the people recording. Tendons had exploded against the white tile, turning the airport floor a murky brown slash red. Strings of long blonde hair, dyed a dingy copper by blood, had flown into every crevice possible. I watched as a sobering child clinging to her mother's leg pulled Tammy's hair from between her toes and clumps. As I screamed over the lumpy remains of my best friend, I couldn't help but think back on Miss Fritz's interview with the local news channel. They attacked populated areas. Then they spread it. Sometimes, they explode. June 17th. They call them the Risen now. A fitting name, I suppose. For those who should stay in their graves. But once, they were us. Friends, family, strangers. Now there is something else entirely. I write this as both a testament to my survival and a plea for understanding for the world I knew was gone, replaced by a relentless nightmare. June 23rd. It all began with whispers, the murmurs of a strange illness sweeping through our town. People brushed it off, as we always do when confronted with something we can't comprehend. But then the whispers grew louder, and the infected began to emerge from their homes, their eyes vacant, their skin pallid. They hungered for the living. June 30th. The outbreak escalated quickly, consuming our town in a relentless tide of death. I watched as neighbors turned on neighbors, the infected tearing into their flesh. Panic spread faster than the virus, and soon, there was no refuge left. I had to make an agonizing choice. Protect my family, or myself. July 10th. The streets are now a wasteland of shattered glass and abandoned cars. The groans of the risen echo through the night, a chorus of despair that never seems to fade. I've learned to move silently, to avoid attracting their attention. I scavenge for supplies, always on the lookout for other survivors who might pose a threat. July 18th. Loneliness has become my constant companion. The sound of my own voice feels foreign, a harsh reminder of the life I once knew. I wonder if I'm the last living soul in this forsaken world. The infected are relentless, and their numbers seem to grow with each passing day. July 25th. I've taken refuge in an abandoned building, fortifying as best I can. Nights are the worst, filled with the distant moans of the risen and the scratching of the doors and windows. Sleep is a fleeting luxury, for every sound, every shadow, sends my heart pounding with dread. August 2nd. This journal is my only companion now. A lifeline to sanity in a world gone mad. I've seen things that would haunt the bravest of souls. Families torn apart. The humanity stripped away from their infected. And the relentless march of the risen. 
It's a world where the line between life and death is blurred into an endless nightmare. August 10th. My supplies are dwindling, and hope, like a fading ember, grows dimmer with each passing day. I don't know if anyone else will read these words, if there are any others out there, hiding the shadows, clinging to the last vestiges of humanity, but I write them anyway, a testament to my existence, a record of the horrors I've witnessed. August 20th. As I prepare to face another night filled with dread and uncertainty, I hold on to the fragile hope that somewhere, somehow, there is a sliver of salvation, a chance to escape this relentless nightmare and find a glimmer of humanity in the darkness. The risen are relentless, but so is my will to survive. The zombie apocalypse comes every night in Sun Creek, Colorado. I've been working the night shift at the Sun Creek graveyard for six years now, and boy, have I seen some weird shit. My name is Andrew J, but most people call me AJ to simplify it. I've lived in Sun Creek, Colorado for my whole life, worked in the graveyard for 14 years, and slowly started to work on the night shift in 2013. Before I started working the night shift, Sun Creek seemed like a strange place, with the unspoken rule that came with living there. Don't be outside after 10 p.m. Close your windows between 5 and 6 p.m. If something in your house goes missing, report it to the police department immediately. To the strange rumors about otherworldly beings, now, these seem like fairly normal, albeit random, rules of the neighborhood, which have had many logical explanations. Then I began working the night shift. Before I start telling you about my job, I feel like I should give you some background knowledge to Sun Creek first. According to local legend, Sun Creek, Colorado appeared out of the blue around 1927, as if it had always been there. In the first few years after the town's appearance, Many weird events happened that made it fairly well known in the towns closest to it. People were afraid to visit it. Fearing the tales of mass murderers and frogs raining from the sky were far more real than just stories. Not much media was around at the time, so word about Sun Creek spread a lot slower. But in time, it became less of an urban legend and more of a fact. One of the stranger aspects of the town is the mayor of Sun Creek. Nobody knows his real name and it's said that he has been the mayor of the town for almost a hundred years, but he never seems to age. He only comes out of his manor on very rare and special occasions, such as the election, which nobody has ever run against him, and occasional holidays. The strange part about him is the fact that, while you're only able to look at him, you can't really see him. You can tell vaguely what he looks like, but you can't ever focus on him directly. Now, I haven't seen or met the mayor personally, but I've heard a lot about him from my neighbor, Jack Eden. Jack is the very definition of conspiracy net. He will randomly go on ranting about how demons are controlling everyone's minds, or he'll claim to have found a list of rules that have been followed down to the dot, but when questioned about, he miraculously can't find them anywhere. He might be a little weird, and possibly crazy, but he's a fun person to be around, so I ignored it at first. Now. After I started working in the graveyard, I believe every word he says. In my time that I worked the day shift, it was about as ordinary as you could expect for a graveyard. A person would die, I'd dig a hole, and the service would happen an hour or two later. I got paid fairly well doing this, and I had enough to keep a steady, happy life in Sun Creek. Every once in a while, weird things would happen, but they were usually passed off by me as a sense of deja vu such as a hole being dug up despite having buried someone there the day before, or a strange row of graves that all had the same name despite having different death dates. The real problem started for me once I began working the night shift. Some things I was not taught by my superiors, so to my surprise, I was handed a gun on my first night working the night shift with a single set of instructions. Use it only when necessary. We don't want to cause too much noise. From there, my supervisor led me to the mausoleum, which had an array of bats, clubs, blades, and spears inside. When the others get here, they'll instruct you on what to do. Until then, I'd suggest not eating anything you don't want to have come back up. Not long after he left, three more people came into the mausoleum right before midnight. Is this the new guy? One of them said, receiving a nod from the others. 
The one who I recognized as Samuel, a person who had been promoted the year before I had, spoke up. At precisely midnight tonight, you are going to witness something you cannot discuss with anybody else. He gestured to the assortment of weapons. Arm yourself with one of these, and be prepared for what you see at midnight. Roughly three minutes later, I heard a low buzzing sound. The two others, who had been introduced themselves as Ron and Alice, gripped their weapons tightly. When they start coming, they should be relatively easy to kill. Just make sure none of them get to the front gate. I was instructed by Ron. The dead rise here every night, and every night we kill them again without fail. The three of them grinned at the dumbfounded confusion as a cracking noise was heard from deep inside the tunnels of the mausoleum. Here they come, Samuel said, giving me a thumbs up. Just don't freak out. <sighs> that night was possibly the worst night of my life. The creatures resembling neighbors I had once known and people I had never met kept coming until the buzzing noise stopped at around 5.30 in the morning. Despite how disturbing my first night was, the pay was good, and it wasn't terrible work. So for the past six years, I've been working night after night, handling these creatures along with an ever-changing crew. Not many people stick around very long, and of the three people that were there when I joined, only Ron has stuck around. I guess the reason why I'm writing all this down is that I'm scared. For the past six years, it's been the same thing every night, without fail. For the past few weeks, however, things have changed. The creatures are acting smarter and more aggressive. I've seen creatures with slight mutations that make them harder to kill. I even saw a creature that appeared to be made up of several dozen children. That creature I hacked to bits until it was nothing more than a bloody pulp. Something has happened though, and I don't know what it is yet. But for the safety of the town and everybody inside it, I'm going to find out what it is, or die trying. My shift's starting soon. I'll update you when I can. File. 2TR1H9. File number. 3196.52R. File name. T2R1H9. File date creation. June 15th, 2018. File creator. Dr. X. Fitzgerald. File description. Details and summary of the 2TR1H9 virus. Date. June 15th, 2018. On Monday, June 4th, 2018, symptoms of a virus began to appear in several regions of the American Southwest, Central America, and Southeast Asia. Physical descriptions of the illness were reminiscent of certain animal bites, but none could be matched to a specific animal. The origin of the virus is unknown. I will continue to post my findings as they come, including updates about new symptoms. Good night for now. Dr. Xander J. Fitzgerald. Known Symptoms June 15, 2018 High Fever 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit 38 degrees Celsius Dry Mouth Pain Wheezing Sweaty Palms Body Aches Muscle Soreness Nausea Loss of Appetite Inflammation of the Joints Necrosis of the Tissue at Source Date June 23, 2018 the CDC has officially released a press statement as of 8.13 a.m. Eastern Standard Time this morning on Saturday, June 23, 2018, to discuss the status of the disease. They have verified that the new strain, now formally referred to as T2R2H9 virus, is legitimate. They're working on finding a cure and methods on how to contain it. The Department of Defense has yet to confirm the allegations of initiating martial law to quarantine major cities in which the virus has been do documenting more reports of the virus. Known symptoms, June 23, 2018. No changes. Date, June 26, 2018. A new break has come in in search of a cure for the virus. An independent medical group stationed in Chicago, Illinois, has reported that they have attempted to see if they can slow the rate at which the virus spreads or terminate it with rounds of known antibiotics. Despite their findings being deemed inconclusive by the CDC, their findings suggest that nothing they tried worked to slow or destroy the virus. Known symptoms, June 26, 2018, no changes. Date, July 1, 2018. The CDC has released a new statement as of yesterday, Saturday, June 30, 2018. They announced that none of their attempts to terminate the virus has worked and that it's starting to replicate itself faster. 
symptoms of T2R1H9 have begun to appear in parts of Europe, Africa, and Oceania. A report from Thailand also came out corroborating their findings, as well as verification that the virus is evolving. No information is yet to be found leading to a definitive cause of the virus origin. No word is still yet to be announced from the Department of Defense about the initiation of martial law. However, news outlets have speculated rumors about a bill that will temporarily shut down trade ports and airlines as a means to attempt to contain the virus. Known Symptoms, July 1, 2018 Hallucinations, painful blisters, vomiting, dilated veins, rapid weight loss, tremors, mood swings, high white blood cell count. Date, July 5th, 2018. Chaos has begun to set in the news about the virus continues to spread. The public is in unrest, and most are fleeing to rural areas to escape the violence of the cities. The Department of Defense has officially placed the United States of America under martial law and instructs all nations who have yet to follow suit to do so as soon as possible. Autopsies of those who have been killed before the virus could fully spread have yet to provide leads to a potential cause to help examiners get closer to find a cure. Examination of the body showed that several major organs appeared heavily deoxygenated and inflamed, even hours after experiencing the first symptoms. Dissection of the infected organs revealed they were filled with pus or what resembled black mold. One examiner, T. Kanai, said that upon examining one of the mouths of the deceased, he noticed that their teeth were abnormal. She initially assumed the individual had gingival recession, but their gums were perfect and showed no signs of disease or decay. Instead, it was their teeth that seemed to be moving, as if there were new teeth trying to push their way up to the surface. Kanai also commented that something about their eyes made her uncomfortable, but declined to comment any further. Known Symptoms, July 5th, 2018. Potential Tooth Loss. Date, July 9th, 2018. The CDC has set up quarantine centers across the United States, Canada, and Mexico as means to section off the infected from the healthy. In these government-sanctioned camps, Medical staff and government personnel have released statements about their findings as they do test runs to find a cure, which were leaked to the deep web and appeared on various political and government message boards over the past 48 hours. According to personnel at an undisclosed base in Arizona, they revealed that some of the symptoms have taken a drastic and sinister turn to the worst. An unidentified petty officer and medical examiner reported seeing infected individuals with lure black sclerus as well as a sudden loss of their fingernails and seizures. Their accounts have yet to be confirmed, and the CDC has ordered that all deceased individuals are to be burned as a safety precaution whether or not they're infected with the virus. The virus has been confirmed as being in six continents, and all airports and borders in 110 countries have been closed on as of Monday, July 9, 2018. Known Symptoms, July 9, 2018. Fingernail Loss. Outbursts of Rage. Date, July 17, 2018. A research team in Wyoming has taken the data calculated from the base in Arizona and decided to do a series of experiments to study how the virus changes. According to the study, they took three patients who are at different rates of the infection, placed them under heavy surveillance in separated chambers on Tuesday, July 10, 2018 at 1300. Day 1. Subject number 1. Sex unspecified. Age 25 showing mild moderate symptoms, loss of appetite, moderate body aches, tremors, nausea, vomiting, and mild hallucinations, visual. Overall health, stable, mood or temperament, good, thoughts, clear. Subject number two, sex, female, age 33, showing moderate severe symptoms, rapid weight loss, nausea, vomiting, dilated veins, Mild discolored of the salaris, fingernail loss, moderate hallucination, visual and auditory, mild moderate tremors, and a high blood cell count. Overall health, stable, mood or temperament, fine, thoughts, scattered. Subject number three, sex, male, age 45, showing severe symptoms, demonstrates some degree of all the known symptoms with the exception of loss of appetite. Subject number three shows symptoms have yet to be documented amongst the infected. One, his original teeth have all fallen out and replaced by a row of jagged, sharp teeth made for ripping flesh from bone 
and two, a form of Wendigo psychosis, which is characterized by a deep craving for human meat as food. Upon being given a cooked steak, he refused to eat it. When given a raw steak, he became curious, only to throw it across the room after tasting it. When given a scrap bucket of viscera from the morgue, he took it into a corner and devoured all the contents. Overall health, unstable. Mood or temperament, easily distressed and volatile. Thoughts, scattered and unclear. Day 4. Subject number 1. Condition has steadily gotten worse. Subject number 1's Solaris has turned black and now expresses bouts of intense rage. Overall health, unstable. Mood or temperament, unpredictable. Thoughts, unclear. Subject number 2. Condition has remained stable. She still has no appetite and has to be guided to eating. Her scleras are dark gray and several of her teeth have been replaced with the same teeth as subject number three. Subject number two refuses to sleep or can't. Overall health, stable, mood or temperament, anxious, thoughts scattered. Subject number three, conditions remain unstable. He refuses to eat any food items that aren't in his bucket and has been documented demonstrating violent bursts of rage if his needs aren't met accordingly. Subject number three requires maximum level amount of security when having food transferred to him and has demonstrated inhuman amounts of strength. He was also recorded from surveillance cameras, tormenting and agonizing on duty staff. Overall health, unstable. Mood or temperament, unstable. Thoughts, scattered and cloudy. Day seven, subject number one. Condition has slowly gotten worse, now demonstrating incredible bouts of strength, throwing their bed across the room when their demands aren't met. When subject number one's fingernails were collected for testing, they attacked an on-duty officer, mildly injuring him in the process. Subject number one refuses to talk to or comply with the orders of staff officials. The status of the guard's help is yet to be disclosed. Overall health, unstable, mood or temperament, agitated, thoughts, unclear. Subject number two, condition has slowly gotten worse. Her loss of appetite has receded and she now claims to have an un insatiable appetite for raw meat. When asked why, she said she doesn't know, only that she feels like she's going to die if she doesn't. On-duty staff decided to test their theory, placing a raw steak in a large bucket of harvested viscera on her table. After some time, she took a liking to the contents of the bucket over the steak. After finishing the contents, she was asked why she made the choice she did, to which she said she doesn't know, only that something told her to, to and how she thinks she wants more. Overall health, good. Mood or temperament, stable, yet easily distraught. Thoughts, clear. Subject number three. During the sixth night, subject number three attacked and killed an unarmed staff member in his cell. The guard was found crudely disemboweled, his organs gone, and his blood splattered across the room. The subject was found in the corner of his cell, smiling with blood on his face, arms, and body. All attempts to subdue him by armed personnel failed and was fatally gunned down as a last resort. Overall health, terminated. The experiment has been terminated, but subject number one and subject number two were sent to a maximum security area for further examination before being reintegrated with the base. Subject number one show little signs of improving, and subject number two is unclear. Known symptoms, July 17, 2018. Insomnia, paranoia, suicidal ideation, changes in appearance of teeth, and fingernails, mishappened, deformed, and jagged. Strong cravings for human flesh. Date, July 20th, 2018. This will be my last update for some time. I'm going to be boarding a private flight with a group of on-base scientists to a base in the American Northwest to collect more data on the virus, which will include myself, KW, JG, OA, MN, DZ, NV, and AM. I'll do my best to update my log regularly when we arrive to my destination. We're expected to depart on Tuesday, July 24th, 2018 at 0300. We've been informed ahead of time that we'll have to receive extensive training before we would be allowed to interact with the infected directly, meaning we'll only have access to interviews and data by means of surveillance footage or by means of separation as demonstration with the experiment. We'll be careful and the next update should be from our findings at the base. As of now, no more information has come forward about the status of any recent discovered symptoms. Date, July 26, 2018. 
We landed at the base two days ago, and our search for Akira is gone as planned. My investigation team and I are going to undergo our official training tomorrow morning, which will give us time away from the lab to get acclimated to what it will be like to work with the infected up close. We're nervous, but hopeful. We've been informed that representatives from CDC, based on the East Coast, will be flown in via a private service to work alongside us in our mission to provide a vaccine for the virus, with the hope that it will prevent it from spreading further. The current estimated number of infected population is 956 million. Known symptoms, July 26, 2018. No changes. Date, July 31st, 2018. Our training course has been successful and we're scheduled to start getting to work with the infected in the next few days. Several of my colleagues are hopeful that if we don't find a cure soon, we'll at least find a patch to slow the virus replication rate. Yet, many others remain skeptical and doubtful, with this being the fastest spreading virus that we've come to know, infecting nearly one-seventh of the world population in less than two months. I'm going to call this update closed for now, as I have a lot of papers to handle, and my designated team and I have to transport some of the infected to a new security base. Known symptoms, July 31st, 2018. No changes. Date, August 1st, 2018. Shit, shit. Something went wrong during the transportation process. When we were escorting the infected inside, a guard didn't see two infected individuals that were roaming the premises unsupervised, being subsequently attacked in the process. We weren't prepared for this. They didn't train us for this. We tried to quickly get to the other side, but the two infected ragers got in with us. They attacked the five of us, who were close to the door, an unarmed guard, OA, KW, NV, and myself. I was too slow, and one thing they don't tell you during your training ops is that they bite hard. We're being placed under quarantine for the next few days to check on us, just in case they microscopically broke any skin during the scuffle. I was given permission to bring my computer into my designated chamber so I can continue to work while I'm recovering. In the event I have to become infected with the virus, I'll be given a series of test drugs to see if they'll cancel out the negative effects of the virus. I'll also be documenting my experiences with those as the days unfold. This is going to be a long, long ride. Update number one. It's been two hours since we were quarantined, and just over three since we were initially attacked. I was bitten and scratched on my left calf, and the pain was excruciating. I was screaming and cursing at the top of my lungs nearly the entire way to the emergency unit. The pain was like anything I had ever felt being a combination of what I can only describe as a snake bite, a wasp sting, and a second-degree burn being magnified tenfold. After my wounds were disinfected and patched up, I was given a round of test antibiotics and a morphine pump before escorted to my isolation chamber. The room is sterile and smells vaguely of pine and cedar. I have a single metal frame bed, a desk connected to the wall, a single shelf above the desk, and a small table where my meals would be served. It feels surreal to being in a room like this, knowing what becomes of those during the experiment. At the moment, I feel fine. The morphine has been helping a lot to dull the pain. The only thing to report on is that the muscles in my left leg feel agitated and sore. Symptoms, August 1st, 2018. Muscle aches, pain, manageable with medication. Update number two. I got a couple messages from people asking how I'm doing and how the rest of my team is. It's been six hours since my last post, and I'm starting to feel nauseous and experiencing some dizziness. Though whether or not that's attributed to the virus, or as a side effect of the medication they have me on, I'm not sure. As far as the others go, I haven't been told yet. I'll do my best to remember to ask a guard the next time one of them comes by to check on my vitals. I'm going to try to get some rest and see if that helps or not. Symptoms update. August 1st, 2018. Nausea, cause, undetermined. Dizziness, cause, undetermined. Date, August 2nd, 2018. It's day two of my recovery process. I woke up at 0600 to have my vitals checked and had breakfast served to me at 0630. I'm still feeling nauseous, so I didn't have much of an appetite. I picked at some of the fruit they gave me and resorted to mainly sticking to a cup of hot coffee. I feel heavy and fatigued all the time, as if I just have a serious cold. I might go back to bed soon. I don't have the energy to move around right now. I'm going to respond to some emails I got in regards to the recent updates and then call it quits until I have my vitals checked again at 12.30 hours. Symptoms update, 
August 2nd, 2018. Loss of appetite. Fatigue. Update number one. It's 12.45, and I woke up in excruciating pain about an hour ago. I jolted up in my sleep feeling like my skin was on fire, and I felt like I tore a muscle. Not pulled or strained, but tore a muscle. As if it was ripping itself from the bone. I tried to give myself as many pumps of morphine as I could, but I'm on a time system, so even after a full dose, I was still in tremendous pain half an hour after the fact. An armed guard and two medical personnel came in to get my vitals, and I told them about my pain levels. They assured me that this was normal, and to not worry. I also asked how the unnamed guard, KW, OA, and NV were doing. They told me they were doing fine, and they should be discharged soon. If they or others from my group come by to check on me, I'll be able to verify their statements then. I'm going to try to eat something light to get my strength up, and then possibly get back to working on some papers for my bed. The current estimated infection population, according to the main CDC headquarters, has reached 1.7 billion. Symptoms update. August 2nd, 2018. No changes. Update number two. It's 1835, and the medical personnel gave me some medication to bring my appetite up, and so far, it's helping. I was able to clear off a sandwich and a small salad, and I'm doing well with holding it down. The medic who checked on me took some new labs, and I said I should have my results in tomorrow afternoon to see if the antibiotics are working or not. They were surprised I was as calm as I was at the time, and that it was a relief for them. I asked them what they meant by that, but they wouldn't budge. I pried them about it till I got them to cave in. I'm still part of the investigation, and I have the right to know what's going on. They told me that they've worked with hundreds or even thousands of people who have been affected by the virus, and that knowing how calm, almost unaware of how sick I truly was, caught them off guard. They continued to say that the mood swings are one of the most commonly reported symptoms, and are more often than not violent. I stopped them for a moment, asking what they meant by the last thing they said, about not being aware of how sick I really was. They immediately froze and stopped talking, as if they realized they said something they weren't supposed to. They just grabbed their supplies and left without saying anything else. I'm starting to get a little scared, and I still haven't seen the rest of my team. I'm going to try to get some rest again, soon. I can hear a storm coming, and from the looks of it, it won't be a good one. Symptom update. August 7th, 2018. No changes. Date. August 4th, 2018. I apologize for not updating yesterday like I should have. The weather has been atrocious, and our entire grid lost power from 0430 to 2050. I was able to get some notes typed out before my battery died. Here's what I was able to recall. My morning routine went much the same, and I was able to be escorted to a quarter area to clean myself up. Getting some fresh air away from my confinement was some fine, but I still felt like a caged animal with how close I was being monitored. My body aches and pains have subsided, and I was able to move around more without feeling like I need some type of assistance. My appetite has come back, and was able to make up for all the calories I missed in the form of heavy, nutritious shakes and protein bars. Working in near darkness threw my circadian rhythm off, and I ended up sleeping most of the day. Today was much the same. After the power came back, I was finally able to get my lab results back, and my white blood cell count was triple what it should have been. My body knew something was wrong, and was doing its best to fight off whatever it was. The medic who saw me the previous day came back to administer more antibiotics and experimental test drugs, as well as give me another physical. In the light of the room, they were able to make out my features closer and get better readings. The veins in my hands and arms were mild, moderately dilated, and both my fingernails and cuticles were chipped slash torn and beginning to bleed. They checked my vision, pausing for a moment to take notice of what I didn't want to believe were the color of my eyes. They just gave me this look, one where you know they're hiding something from you. They continued to examine and told me that everything was checking out, but whatever or not that was a good thing, they wouldn't say. But one thing is certain, I'm infected. And if my reports over the last two months have been indicative of anything, it's that this is only the beginning and things are going to get worse from here on out. Symptoms update, August 4th, 2018. Dilated veins, discolored of the sclera, dark gray and blotchy. Increased appetite, damage to fingernails and cuticles. Date, August 5th, 2018. I wasn't able to sleep last night. 
All I could think about is how the past five days have gone and how this isn't what I wanted out of coming here. I spent a good hour throwing up, terrified of knowing what awaits me when this damn disease spreads further. I can't stop thinking about the two subjects in the last month's update that are still, hopefully, alive. I can't help but imagine the fear and dread they must have feel or have, knowing there is an insidious being raging inside them, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. I wonder how many of them tried to fight back against it, and how many gave up and caved to the beast. While I was curled up on the floor in a mess of my own pity and sorrow, I thought about subject number three, wondering which category he was in during all this. Did he try to fight to suppress the side effects, or did he lose hope and let it win? In the days leading up to him being brought in for the study, he seemed fine, albeit distressed. He was clearly hiding something, perhaps trying to mask his pain as the virus weighed him down. I don't know. I can only hope he's at peace now, and that the other two, wherever they are, can have some solace in knowing that we're going to beat this thing. I don't know how or when, but we will. We've survived the bubonic plague, the 1918 Spanish influenza, world wars. In the wake of tragedy, we've proved time and time again that we're strong and we're resilient beings. We're not going down without a damn fight. Everything works out in the end, right? Symptom update, August 5th, 2018. Anxiety, source undetermined. Vomiting, source undetermined. Date, August 6th, 2018. I'm beginning to feel weak again, and all I want to do is sleep. I'm losing sight of what's real and what's not. I can't tell if I'm seeing or feeling things because I'm cracking up, or if it's the virus showing itself more to me. I spent a good five minutes shaking in bed, and had a grand mal seizure when I went to clean myself up for an hour ago, which is something that's never happened to me. I was able to get a hold of DZ and JG, who were given authorization to meet me. For their protection, they were put in especially designated hazmat suits, and I was handcuffed to my desk. It was bittersweet seeing them, and the look on their faces seeing me was otherworldly. I don't know how to describe it, but it's just that bleak look of acceptance you see when people are seeing their loved ones for the last time, as if they instinctively knew that things weren't going to go well for me. They told me the status of the project, to look for a cure, which was going as well as I should have expected. The virus was replicating at an alarming rate and there was no telling what could be used or, to, or done to slow it down, even a fraction of the rate it was developing. The virus was changing its structure almost every 72 hours, like clockwork, and predicting its next makeup structure was impossible. In layman's terms, we were fucked. I then asked about how the others were doing. MN and AM were fine, and were planning on heading back to our original camp to get away from all the stress they were dealing with here. When I asked about KW, OA, and V and the guard, they were quiet. JG asked me if I was serious, and then became angry when I told him I had no clue what either of them were talking about. I didn't even know how they got hurt or how bad it ultimately was. Only that wasn't the only one who got attacked. DUZ was surprised that I wasn't told about anything, and proceeded to fill me in on the best of their abilities. The day after we were quarantined, they got the news that OA died sometime during the night when her aorta ruptured, sometime in her sleep. KW was in and out of the operating room since yesterday for what they were only told was organ failure, and NV was stable, but refusing to talk to anyone. I asked them about the guard again, and they told me when they went in to visit KW in the ICU. They swore they saw someone strapped to a gurney, screaming about how the fucking disease is going to kill us all, and kill me now before it makes me hurt you. Before they left, they tried to comfort me and tell me that they were not going to stop looking for a way to beat this, even if they had to die trying. JG added that he was going to send me something to look over when he gets back to his dorm. He told me it was for my eyes only, and did not share it with anyone in our circles. I wasn't sure what he meant by that, but I told him I'd keep his promise. Symptom changes. August 6, 2018. No changes. Update number one. I got JG's file attachment, and I spent an hour analyzing it. If what he sent me is true, then this changes everything. Not only for our investigation team, but all of us. In all my years as a virologist, I've never seen anything like this before, and it could possibly be one of the most blatant cases of medical malpractice I've ever seen. If this is real, 
then it would be morally repugnant for me to keep this a secret. I'll post an update in an hour of my decision. I'm starting to feel sick again. My back pain is starting to surge again. Update number two. God damn it. I don't know what to even make of this now. I fired a message to JG, asking if anyone else in our group knows about this. He replied back quickly, telling me that DZ does, and he plans on telling MN and AM before they board their flight back home. I could tell he knew I was on something, to which he sent me an angry email back. He insisted that if I told anyone about the attachment, that there was going to be dire consequences for all of us. I demanded to know where he got the information from, to which he told me that he talked to the guard he saw strapped to the gurney in private when the medical team was gone. The guard said he saw someone open the gate when the two infected people were, and that it wasn't an accident. The guard was adamant that the attack was on purpose, and that he was sure he wasn't the intended target, but one of us were. He went on to say that he found the two surviving candidates from the test. Subject number two told him how she became infected with the virus. She claims that she was a child psychologist turned EMT in the wake of the outbreak, and that she often hopped from base to base to help where she could. While stationed in a base near Atlanta, she was approached by a group that claimed to work for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services about partaking in a clinical study to try a potential vaccine against the virus. When she declined, feeling something off about them, she claimed she was stowed into her back of a van and injected with the what she believed to have been a strain of the virus. She was found abandoned several miles outside Chattanooga, with no recollection of her captures. Unable to believe the story for himself, she showed him scars she had got from the struggle and where she began to develop partial necrosis at the infection site. I thought she was bullshitting me until he sent me the photos as proof. My stomach sank, seeing what she went through. He continued by saying that she's sure this entire outbreak wasn't a fluke or freak of nature, but something deeper. This whole thing is making my head spin. I'm going to call it quits for the night. I'm starting to feel like someone's watching me. The current estimated infection population is believed to be 2.8 billion. Symptoms, August 6, 2018. No changes. Date, August 7, 2018. I woke up to my pillow and bed sheets being soaked with blood, and I wasn't sure why. When I went to open my mouth to call for help, my teeth began to fall out one by one. I don't think I ever screamed that loud before in my life, and it took two guards to hold me back so I wouldn't hurt myself. I watched helplessly as a medic bagged my teeth and collected a sample of my blood, walking away as if nothing happened. I don't think my brain had time to process what was going on, so I instinctively ran my tongue across the inside of my mouth, hoping this was some kind of fucked up dream and that this wasn't happening. All I could feel were jagged edges where my teeth once were almost like shards of broken glass. I snapped and started wailing on anyone or anything that was close to me. I had enough. Whatever this shit was, a natural occurrence or some damn test by the government, it was finally starting to really hit me that this was real. I could feel my blood boil as I threw everything I could get my hands on across the room. I smashed my table to pieces and ripped the shelf from the wall, stripping the bolts in the process. It wasn't until I was coming down from my rage that I saw the extent of what I had done. Not only was my room destroyed, but I also broke my left hand in the process. The weirdest part, though, was that I wouldn't have even noticed unless I saw it for myself or had it pointed out to me. I can't tell if my outburst made me invincible or if I'm no longer able to feel pain. I'll let you know when I test my hypothesis again. Symptom Updates, August 7, 2018 Complete Tooth Loss Outbursts of Rage Mood Swings Inability to Feel or Sense Pain Source Undetermined Date, August 13, 2018. I've been at work testing my theory about my ability to process pain, or possible lack of theory. I took one of the pins off my jacket and poked at the back of my hand. Nothing. I tried prodding the tips of my fingers. Nothing. I tested again on my arm, skewering a small piece of my skin in the process. Still nothing. No pain or anything to speak of. Even after I started to bleed again, I wanted to push my now, almost certain hypothesis even further. I took one of my fountain pens and rolled up my sleeve. I gripped the pen tight in my hand, and with all my strength, I stabbed myself in the upper arm. I could feel the nib of the pen bend from the force, snapping upon making contact with my humerus when it broke through the skin. I ripped the pen out of my arm, sending a large spurt of blood across the floor. Nothing. I barely felt it. What the fuck? I looked at the now broken, useless pen in my hand, covered in blood and what was left of the ink. 
I stared at it, fascinated. A new thought was starting to cross my mind. I knew now that my hypothesis was correct, that this wasn't a side effect of my mood swings. This was something entirely different. I finally knew, or at least was quite certain, that I could no longer feel pain. Now I couldn't help but wonder if I would find myself in a place where I could no longer feel anything at all. I'll update you on the theory when the time comes. A symptom update, August 13th, 2018. Inability to feel pain, confirmed. Date, August 15th, 2018. I've been poring over my notes and trying to come to a conclusion as to what I'm going to do with the information JG gave me. The signs were everywhere that this wasn't normal and it was something the public needed to know. However, the question was what would we do would make things complicated. Do we kill the infected, no matter the stage of their diagnosis? Do we just launch all our nukes and hope there's enough survivors to start over? I don't know. I finally saw my face for the first time in what feels like weeks. It was eerie to say the least to see how this was manifesting itself. Staring back at me in an attempt to diagnose myself, the physical characteristics of the virus was nearing its final stages for me. My teeth were starting to come back, but weren't like they once were. Now were almost cryptid-like in their appearance. The capillaries of my skin on my face and neck were more prominent, a condition which Division dubbed angel skin, as it gave the appearance of the skin being ethereal and almost translucent. My eyes have succumbed to changes as well, becoming pitch black and almost void-like. Upon closer examination, I noticed that not only did my sclerus change, but my irises did as well, going from brown to black, as if the pigment was eaten away. The texture of the hair on my head wasn't changed, but it seems like the hair everywhere else, aside from my face, was becoming lighter. I don't recognize myself anymore. Is this part of where I have nervous breakdown or get lost in myself? I'll update this later when I can. I'm starting to feel unwell again. My stomach hasn't stopped growling since I left my room. Symptoms update, August 15th, 2018. Arrival of new teeth. Complete discoloration of the iris and sclera. Angel skin. Changes in hair texture. Depersonalization. Update number one. My stomach has been not all day. No matter what I try to alleviate it, it just keeps getting worse. I tried an assortment of anti-nausea medication and tricks, but nothing works. For the past hour, something in the back of my mind has an insatiable craving for something. I couldn't place my finger on it, but the more I lingered on it, the more I knew what was going on. I, I need to test something. Update number two. I just sent a request for something specific to eat, and I'm going to see how this turns out. This is sick. I don't want to do this, but I have to. I have to find out if I'm thinking is true. I'll make another update within the next hour. Update number three. Shit. God damn it. So, I tried to put my theory to the test. It worked. It actually worked. I didn't want to believe it, but it did. I spoke to a guard that was part of my week-long experiment and told them about the craving. She understood what I meant by that and went to go take care of it. She came back with a bucket. That damn bucket. I choked back on my vomit and she put it on this new table in front of me. The smell of the viscera emanated from the bucket was revolting and I almost threw up. The way they almost shined under the fluorescent lighting and a collection of their own fluids brought back painful memories of college and the sheer weight of the bucket caught me off guard. I pulled it close to me and knew there was only one thing I could do. The voice in the back of my head grew louder, telling me if I don't eat, then I'm going to die. If I eat, I'll be okay and it will go away. I swallowed my pride and reached into the bucket, sloshing the various guts around as they slid across each other. The feeling of wanting to vomit came back as I felt how slick they were. I picked up a chunk of meat and tore it with my teeth. The muscle was tough but gave way the more I ripped into it. It reminded me of a cut of choice meat you would use for a stew. It had some bite to it, and wasn't stringy. The nausea I had moments ago melted away the more I ate, and that's when I knew I was right. This was it. This was the symptom I feared the most, as it signaled the last state of the changes that my team and I were made aware of. Part of me knew that this was wrong, and that this wasn't the kind of person I was. This was sick. This was fucked up. Yet I couldn't stop. For a moment, any ounce of self-control I went out the window along with whatever humanity I held on to. I was becoming the very thing I was afraid of and that there was not going back. This disease, this damn disease made my grave for me and now I have to lie in it. I don't know how to tell my team about this. I don't even know if NV or KW are alive at this point. 
I just hope that the rest of them are able to get the fuck out of here while they can, especially if the guard were telling the truth. This will probably be my last update. I don't trust myself to be around other people, and I don't know when or if I'm going to lose myself to this. There's no telling if I'll be the same person a month from now, a week from now, or even tomorrow. I just don't know. That's why I'm stepping away from the investigation as of writing this. I'm so sorry, but I have to do this. I have to do what's in my best interest, and trying to fight this thing isn't one of those things anymore. As part of my way to say goodbye, I'll be leaving an attached documents I've exchanged with JG. Whether or not you choose to use them is up to you. I don't care. They won't be any of use for me anymore. To whoever may be reading this, it's over. There's no going back for us as a society. We're too far gone, and there's nothing we can do to stop the virus. If you're one of the lucky ones, run. Run as fast as you can and avoid the infected while you can. It's up to you to decide whether or not you're a species worth fighting for. The power is in your hands. God forgive us all. This is the end. My only friend, the end. It hurts to set you free, but you'll never follow me. The end of the laughter and soft lies. The end of the nights we tried to die. This is the end. Good night for the last time. Dr. Xander J. Fitzgerald. I've kept my mouth shut for almost 50 years. Why the hell would I start talking now? Well, friends, terminal cancer will do that to you. Shit you thought you'd take to the grave suddenly becomes shit you desperately want to tell someone. Anyone. I won't bore you with a long lament about my time in Vietnam. It was shitty. It was shitty for everyone involved. It was particularly shitty for me, as I was 5'3". If you don't know what being particularly short during the Vietnam War entailed, let me fill you in. You arrive in country, and a senior officer points to you and says, You'd be a good fit for the tunnel commandos. Want to join? Now technically, it's a question, as service in those platoons was voluntary, but it sure as shit didn't feel like a question, it felt like an order. And so that was my burden for the war, to be a tunnel rat, climbing down into deep, dank, dangerous tunnels filled with people and animals who wanted to kill me. Usually we operated in the huge, coochie tunnel complex near Saigon, but not on that day. On that day, we were ordered to investigate a tunnel complex way up north, west of Da Nang, Two of us were sent to the tunnel that day, myself and Benoit. Now usually black guys manage to avoid becoming tunnel rats, on account of them being so tall. But Benoit was burdened with the double misfortune of being short and black during the Vietnam War. A curse I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I was first in the hole and Benoit followed. We both had our Model 39s, some C4, our wits, and not much else. If you wondered why we carried the small caliber Model 39s, Go fire a Colt 45 in a narrow tunnel and come back to me. The last guy who tried that got a ticket home with blood pouring out of his ears. We crawled for what felt like an age. The tunnel was a tight fit, which meant it was probably freshly dug. It also stank something foul. That usually meant either spoiled food or some poor VC bastard died down there and was left to rot. After about 40 minutes of crawling in total silence, I saw the tunnel ahead open into a room. I tapped Benoit on the head with my foot. I heard him ready his pistol. I climbed down to the open chamber, pointing my pistol to the shadows. The room was dimly lit by a small oil lamp. It was also deserted. We took a moment to adjust. It was the longest single tunnel segment either of us had ever crawled through. It also had no traps, which was unusual. Where was everyone who dug the damn thing, save for the lamp hanging from the roof and a canvas tarp on the opposite wall? The room was empty. I approached the tarp and used my pistol to move it aside. Behind the tarp was a stone staircase leading down. A stone staircase this far underground? I whispered to Benoit. BC didn't build this. This is an old, very old, older than America old. Benoit whispered back with fear in his voice. We've come this far. We have to keep going, I replied. We both walked slowly down the narrow staircase. Our flashlights had red lenses and I swear the illuminated staircase looked like we were descending into hell. The staircase was almost as deep as the tunnel was long. Finally, I saw the staircase blocked by another tarp. Light was coming from the other side. I moved aside the tarp with my pistol. My finger trembled on the trigger. My eyes lit up. My heart raced. I almost pulled the trigger. But I didn't. Something made me pause. The room had at least ten people in it. 
none of them armed. I pointed my pistol at the group and illuminated them with my flashlight. They didn't respond. They just stood there rocking gently forward and back. Benoit, don't shoot. There's people in here. But there's something wrong with them. I stepped into the tiny room which was lit only by small candles. Benoit followed. We both shone our flashlights at the people. They paid no attention. They continued to rock gently forward and back. I shone my flashlight in one of their faces. I clicked my fingers. She didn't respond. Her clothes told me she was VC. They were all VC. Three women and seven men. All gently rocking forward and back. Not a care in the fucking world. Their eyes were a solid color. Which color I can't really say as I could only illuminate them with my red flashlight. Ben Ma motioned with his flashlight to the corner. The rifles all sat in the pile, badly rusted. Jesus Christ. Benoit, how long have these poor fuckers been down here? I don't think Jesus Christ frequents this establishment, came Benoit's terrified response in his thick Cajun accent. I shone my light to the front of the room. The VC were all facing a small altar. I walked toward it. On the simple stone plinth stood a gold statue illuminated by several candles. The statue was ornately crafted. It was of a beautiful naked woman. The top half, anyway. The bottom half was something like an octopus. Dozens of tiny gold tentacles had been meticulously crafted to a woman's torso instead of legs. The statue had some writing at its base, a writing I didn't recognize. I reached out to pick up the statue and take a better look, but Benoit shouted, Stop! Don't touch it! I retracted my hand about an inch from the statue. We need to leave this place, quickly, Benoit said as he put his hand on my shoulder. Are we just going to leave them like this? I said as I show my light in their eyes. We'll plant the C4 charges and put them on a 90 minute timer, he said. He was already removing the C4 from his pouch on his belt. They're unarmed, I implored, turning to Benoit. These people are dead, maybe worse than dead. I saw something like this once before at home, in the bayou. I didn't argue any longer. We planted the C4 charges in a rush, set the timers for 90 minutes, and ran up the stone staircase as fast as we could. It felt like a lifetime until we reached the small room with the lamp. I climbed to the tunnel, and Benoit followed. Suddenly, we could hear a woman's voice faintly calling from far behind us. Ignore it. Keep moving. Benoit shouted from behind me. I didn't need to be told. I wasn't going back. It was the longest crawl of my life. I saw daylight and kept crawling even though my hands were raw and bloodied. I emerged into the light of day and gasped for fresh air. Benoit followed. We warned the others about the C4 charges, but told them nothing else. Benoit and I sat in total silence away from the tunnel entrance, waiting, praying. The ground shook. A dull thud was heard, and a spray of dirt emerged from the tunnel. We both breathed a sigh of relief. It is only after an experience like that that you ask yourself the small question. To this day, I still ask myself, who the fuck was keeping those candles lit in that damn room? In the grim darkness of the far future... There is only war. The galaxy is a nightmarish landscape where the forces of humanity, aliens, and demons collide in brutal conflict. But even in this brutal universe, there are tales whispered in hushed tones, tales that defy reason and terrify even the most battle-hardened soldiers. This is one such tale, an account of the Necroplague. It began in the desolate world of Gulzar Prime, a forsaken planet within the Imperium's grasp. The campaign against the alien invaders was brutal, but the Imperial Guard fought on, determined to secure this backwater world. As the war raged on, reports of a new threat began to surface. Soldiers whispered of something unnatural, something worse than the foul Xenos they battled. It started with isolated incidents, soldiers disappearing in the night, leaving behind nothing but bloodstained beds. But as the weeks passed, the occurrences grew in frequency and horror. A sergeant named Grimaldus, known for his unshakable resolve, penned an account of his experience in this battle log. Day 42 of the campaign. My men are growing restless. Rumors of the necroplague persist. They speak of the dead rising, their hollow eyes fixed on the living. Superstition and fear grip their hearts. I am determined to quash these tales, but even I cannot ignore the growing unease. As Grimaldus and his regiment pushed deeper into the war-torn landscape, they encountered the first signs of the nightmare they had only heard about. 
The landscape is littered with the remains of the fallen, the Imperial Guardsmen who should have been buried, but now clawed their way out of makeshift graves. Day 55 of the campaign. The dead walk among us. I have seen with my own eyes. Our own comrades, risen from the grave, attack us with unrelenting hunger. Their uniforms are tattered, their flesh rotting, but their eyes burn with malevolent purpose. The situation deteriorated rapidly. Grimaldus' unit was ambushed by the risen dead, and the sergeant fought for his life alongside his dwindling squad. These abominations, once loyal soldiers, now sought to feast on the living. Day 61 of the campaign. We are trapped. The dead are relentless. They have torn through our ranks, and there is no escape. We are haunted by the hollow moans of our fallen comrades, their faces twisted in agony and hunger. Grimaldus' final entry, smeared with blood and desperation, told of their last stand. Day 63 of the campaign. We make our final stand in the remains of an outpost. Our ammunition is depleted, our spirits broken. The necroplate has claimed us, one by one. I hear their footsteps outside, a relentless march of death. If you find this log, remember us. Remember ghouls are prime, and beware the necroplague, for it hungers for the living. What if that nagging feeling in the back of your neck was real? What if those hands reaching out from the dark that you believed were there, were there? What if the monster in the basement really existed? And what if there was really something under the bed? Would you have the courage to face your fears? The change was quite slow, now that I think about it. That's why I wasn't surprised when I lost the family home in the fire. With the family inside. It was tragic, yes. And it took more than a while to pick myself up from the ground. But I think the anticipation helped me cope. It started with the black helicopters. Abe Loveless, who was the PM before mob rule broke out, had ordered a complete shutdown of all borders, but it was no use. Canada, Scotland, Nepal, and China all did the same thing and failed. Even North Korea had fallen into the infection before us. We hoped that Australia would have an advantage, being an island country. But over the course of three years, we couldn't hold the infection off. However, it really wasn't the disease that destroyed us. It was the riots, mobs, and mass hysteria. If someone came down with something as trivial as hay fever, the mob would have grabbed them and thrown them in the river anyway. After a while, Tasmania lost contact with the outside world. The news station burned, planes crashed, and ships sank. At that point came an age which was comparable to the Lord of the Flies. Civil rule took over. Three good people stood above the crowd, trying to bring peace and order to save the lives of their friends and family. Their throats were promptly slit. Then, they inevitably woke up, after three hours slumber, out for blood. Zombies. Before the Zompocalypse, zombies were just a part of myth and legend, which constantly appeared in film, books, and video games. People were obsessed with them. But now all we want to do is escape their decaying grasps. Our once population of 500,000 fell to 300,000 after the first riots. That's when I lost my family. Three hours later, they climbed from the rubble, blackened by fire and reddened by blood. The population fell again to 150,000. After our first year alone, the population continued to fall. People weren't accustomed to the tribal life in Tasmania, which was previously a hub of inhumanity had degraded to a hub of savagery. It became a cause of celebration when you recognized someone from your old life, even if they didn't recognize you back. I'm sorry to break it to you, but my last friend, Sam, didn't make it past 25 years of age. I lost him four years ago. We went on a supply run at an old abandoned grocer's. It had gone untouched during the riots because it was buried under the depths of a rural village. Through an obscure alley and a flight of stairs under the ground, it was filled with rotten fruits and meats, but there were one line of shelves at the back where they were lined with enough preservatives to feed the whole lodge. Hey Sam, do you remember alphabet soup? I asked, picking another can from the shelf. Because that still exists. I hate alphabet soup, he cringed. 
You're a monster, I snapped, hugging the can. Besides, you can't afford to be picky. Fine, he said, snatching a jar of preservative olives from the shelves. I dare you to eat one of these. He knew I feared olives more than death itself. I opened my satchel, placing the alphabet soup in it, and stared at the olives with cautious eyes. Okay, I replied, reaching out for them, when we get back. I'm not going to forget, Sam said, as I placed the olives in my satchel. Later we began to walk up the store, when something caught Sam's eye. No way, he gasped. What? I asked, absentmindedly turning to see what he was looking at. He jumped over the store counter and stepped over the corpse of the owner. Check it, he grinned from ear to ear, picking a strangely shaped black bag from under the shopkeeper's desk. What is it? I asked. Yes, he laughed, ignoring me. It's not empty. He unzipped the bag to pull out a saxophone. I haven't played in years, he gawked. I lost mine in the fire. Oh, my hand tightened around my satchel. I wouldn't put my lips on that. No, I'm not going to. I had a box of old reeds hidden somewhere, he said, putting the saxophone back in the bag and gracefully sliding over the counter, and I'm going to look around for some disinfectant. Sam, I groaned. Why would you need that when we have a perfectly good rusty trombone at base? Pfft, he scoffed. He climbed through the aisles and finally lifted a purple box of disinfectant into the air. We got to the base just before sunset. Base was originally a tourist lodge, and it was constructed as a safe haven by the last tourist in Tasmania, an American named Jacob Sampson. He was a bit of a genius before the Zompocalypse. It would have been called a gated community, but now ungated communities didn't exist, making the word gated redundant. Sam and I settled into our pad and sat around, waiting for Sam to clean his new saxophone. Oh no, I said as he sat down, smiling wildly. This is going to be a nightmare. Just sit back, he said, and let the music take you away. I sighed and stood up. All right, but I'll listen for you from the other room. I moved into the kitchen, opened up a cold can of beans, sat down to eat and attempted to finish the book I was reading. I didn't know why I kept torturing myself, even if the author was still alive. There was no way I was going to get the last book of the series. After an hour passed... I leaned back to ask Sam why it was taking him so long to tune the saxophone. He merely scowled, saying, It is tuned. Later on, I crept into bed, blowing out the lantern on my nightstand. The night had settled around me. I could hear the crickets chirping outside and a group of lodgers chatting far in the distance. The night was icy, but the years had acclimatized me to sleeping in the cold. It didn't take long for sleep to embrace me, but I was awakened by Sam knocking at my door three slow and steady knocks. Travis! He was breathing heavily and painfully forcing his words out. Sam? I asked, jumping out the bed and stepping through the the room. Let me in, he mumbled. What do you want? I asked, sliding the latch along the door. I am hungry. My heart jumped into my throat. There's food in the kitchen, I called through the door. I'm so hungry, Travis, he slurred. Let me in, I'm starving. I slid the latch back into place and backed away from the door. Sam, you better not be joking, I said, backing toward my bedside table and reaching inside for my knife. Give me food, please. I flicked a match and lit my lantern, lifting above me and stepping towards the door. I heard Sam furiously scratching at the wood. Sam, try to control yourself, I said, sliding the latch open and stepping back. The door handle rotated and the door swung inwards. Sam stood in the doorway, staring at me. His eyes were shrouded by his brow. His fingernails were bloody from scratching the door. Beads of sweat were falling from his forehead and his breathing was deep and heavy. His feet padded along the ground as he lumbered toward me. Sam, you got three seconds to get out of here or I'm going to kill you. He froze in his spot and looked up at me. His lips were blue and his right eye was a long strand of mold blooming from it. His left eye was blood red. He snarled and ran straight into my knife. It drove its way into his chest crunching through his sternum and tearing into his heart. His teeth gnashed my ear, so I pushed him back. Once he was far enough away, I kicked him back. He collapsed to the ground, writhing and choking. I jumped onto him and brought the knife down, driving it into his skull. A warm torrent of blood climbed up the knife and bathed my hands. The red pool expanded beside him until his struggling stopped, and he finally died. I could feel my eyes tearing up. 
The stench was unbearable. A deep, stinging sensation filled my limbs and the back of my throat, a feeling of panic. I looked down at his corpse, which was frozen still, and out of the corner of his mouth I spotted it, jammed to the backside of his cheek and covered in brown, sticky blood. It was the reed of the saxophone. The world had crumbled into chaos, and the dead roamed the streets, their hunger insatiable. I couldn't believe what had become of our once vibrant society. The outbreak had struck with ferocious speed, turning friends and family into mindless, ravenous creatures. My name is Jack, and I was one of the few survivors left in this hellish landscape. I had barricaded myself in an abandoned grocery store, scavenging for canned goods and bottled water. It had been weeks since I'd seen another living soul. The days blended into a monotonous routine of searching for supplies, fortifying my hideout, and fighting off the relentless hordes. I had lost count of how many close calls I'd had, narrowly escaping death by a hair's breadth. The smell of decay hung in the air, a constant reminder of the world we had lost. One evening, as I was huddled in a corner, surrounded by flickering candles and clutching my shotgun, a scratching sound echoed from outside. I peered through a crack in the boarded up windows and saw them, a horde of zombies pressing against the makeshift barricades. Panic surged through me as I realized that the barricades wouldn't hold much longer. My heart raced as I grabbed my bag, filled with essentials, and made a desperate decision to escape through the back door. I had to leave the safety of the grocery store if I had any hope of surviving. I burst through the door and the night air hit me like a shock. I moved stealthily through the darkness, my senses heightened to the slightest sound. Every creak of a floorboard, every rustle of leaves sent a chill down my spine. I knew that any noise could attract the undeed. Hours turned into an eternity as I navigated the deserted streets, encountering pockets of danger at every turn. But I couldn't stop. I had to find a safer haven, a place to regroup, and hopefully find other survivors. My journey led me to an old hospital on the outskirts of town. It was a grim and foreboding place, but it seemed secure. The moment I stepped inside, I heard a voice. Hey, over here. It was another survivor, and I wasn't alone. In that moment, hope flickered in the darkness. A glimmer of possibility that we might stand a chance against the relentless tide of the undead. We were survivors, fighting to reclaim the world from the horrors that now walked the earth, one day at a time. My name is Alex, and I woke up in a world where everything I knew had crumbled. The news had been a blur of chaos and despair, as an unknown virus had rapidly spread, turning friends, family, and strangers into mindless, relentless zombies. For weeks, I had taken refuge in an abandoned cabin deep in the woods, far from the hordes. My isolation was numbing, and the silence of the forest was both a comfort and a torment but it was a solitude that had kept me alive. One morning, I ventured out to gather supplies. The forest seemed different, quieter. As I approached the cabin, an eerie sense of unease crept over me. I pushed open the door cautiously and froze. Inside, there stood a woman. Her eyes were vacant, her skin pallid, and her fingers curled into grotesque claws. She had once been my sister, and now she was one of them. I backed away, heart pounding. She lunged at me with a guttural moan, and I barely managed to slam the door shut, barricading it with all my might. My sister's relentless scratching and moaning sent shivers down my spine. Realization hit me. She had tracked me, even in the wilderness. As I retreated further into the cabin, I found my family's old hunting rifle, loaded it, and steeled myself. Tears welled in my eyes as I aimed at the door, knowing that I had to protect myself. Hours passed as I sat with the rifle, my sister's muffled moans a haunting reminder of the nightmare that had become my world. It was a choice I never wanted to make, but when she finally broke through the door, her dead eyes met mine one last time. In that moment, I pulled the trigger, ending her torment and sealing my own fate in this desolate world. I was a survivor, but the cost of survival had left me forever scarred. The world was a wasteland, and I was just another broken soul struggling to endure each day in the relentless grip of the zombie apocalypse. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. 
the galaxy is a nightmarish landscape where the forces of humanity, aliens, and demons collide in brutal conflict. But even in this brutal universe, there are tales whispered in hushed tones, tales that defy reason and terrify even the most battle-hardened soldiers. This is one such tale, an account of the Necroplague. It began in the desolate world of Gulzar Prime, a forsaken planet within the Imperium's grasp. The campaign against the alien invaders was brutal, but the Imperial Guard fought on, determined to secure this backwater world. As the war raged on, reports of a new threat began to surface. Soldiers whispered of something unnatural, something worse than the foul Xeno as they battled. It started with isolated incidents, soldiers disappearing in the night, leaving behind nothing but bloodstained beds. But as the weeks passed, the occurrences grew in frequency and horror. A sergeant named Grimaldus, known for his unshakable resolve, penned an account of his experience in this battle log. Day 42 of the campaign. My men are growing restless. Rumors of the necroplague persist. They speak of the dead rising, their hollow eyes fixed on the living. Superstition and fear grip their hearts. I am determined to quash these tales, but even I cannot ignore the growing unease. As Grimaldus and his regiment pushed deeper into the war-torn landscape, they encountered the first signs of the nightmare they had only heard about. The landscape was littered with the remains of the fallen, the Imperial Guardsmen who should have been buried, but now clawed their way out of makeshift graves. Day 55 of the campaign. The dead walk among us. I have seen with my own eyes. Our own comrades, risen from the grave, attack us with unrelenting hunger. Their uniforms are tattered, their flesh rotting, but their eyes burn with malevolent purpose. The situation deteriorated rapidly. Grimaldus's unit was ambushed by the risen dead, and the sergeant fought for his life alongside his dwindling squad. These abominations, once loyal soldiers, now sought to feast on the living. Day 61 of the campaign. We are trapped. The dead are relentless. They have torn through our ranks, and there is no escape. We are haunted by the hollow moans of our fallen comrades, their faces twisted in agony and hunger. Grimaldus's final entry, smeared with blood and desperation, told of their last stand. Day 63 of the campaign. We make our final stand in the remains of an outpost. Our ammunition is depleted, our spirits broken. The necroplate has claimed us, one by one. I hear their footsteps outside, a relentless march of death. If you find this log, remember us. Remember Ghoul's Prime, and beware the necroplague, for it hungers for the living.' 